Yes, guys. So what is this actuarial gain or loss? And why does this even appear? Now, this is the only standard where we talk about actuarial valuation. Now, what is actuarial valuation? Why is it necessary in this case? Guys, if you remember till now where we were discussing about your interest costs, current service costs, it requires complicated calculation. It might have appeared easy to you because in the example or the illustration which I've taken, I've just taken five years of life. But imagine the employee has entered the organization at the age of 25 and he has another 35 years until retirement age. So that means for 35 discount factors have to be applied. You need to understand that the complicated calculations get involved when we have too many employees. So that is the reason why instead of believing in what the management estimate says, here we will start depending on the work of another expert. We have an uh, auditing standard on that <clears throat> standards on auditing where we talk about work of another expert. So this expert here is called as an actuary. An actuary is a person who has qualified from Indian Actuaries Institute. And he is eligible to give us a valuation with respect to your actuarial, uh, sorry, your fair valuation on what is the obligation of the employer towards the employees in respect of the defined benefit plan. So what does the actuary do and how is it so different from what the management does? Because your management estimate is purely based on the management judgment, which may not be right. There is always a case where there is a management judgment which can utterly go wrong. Absolutely, right? So what we try to do here is we bring in a professional value. Now, let's say for example, you write an assessment test or a mock test. So in the mock test, when I asked you to estimate what could be your score, you said, sir, I would be scoring something between 65 to 70 marks. That is your estimate of the exam that you have written. But what is a fair estimate of what you have, uh, of what is the marks that you're going to secure? So I'll have to bring in a mock examiner. The mock examiner is going to reevaluate your paper and based on his evaluation of paper, he will come up and say that this paper is eligible to get about 62 to 65 marks. So he is coming up with a much better estimate or I would put it like this, that he is in a much better position to give an estimate than what you are. Same thing. Management is trying to identify their obligation, but their assessment might be significantly different from a professional assessment by a qualified person. That is the reason why since these involve significant amount of management estimates, I will try to rely on the work of another expert who has technical knowledge in making such fair value assessment. And that person in this case is called as Indian actuary. This actuary has multiple valuation models, but the one model which is prescribed by your India S19 and also was prescribed under, under your AS15 as far as your IGAP was concerned is called as PUCM model, which is called as projected unit cost model. So what is happening under PUCM model is very simple. The Indian Actuaries Institute has identified a person called as actuary who is qualified. And this qualified actuary is trying to make an assessment of fair value. Does he also believe in certain assumptions? Yes, he does. He also believes in some judgments. He'll also believe in certain assumptions, but they are more reliable. Why are they more reliable? Because he's a qualified person to make an estimate. Therefore, it is more reliable than what the management simply assesses. So what does the actuary actually do or what is the actuarial valuation actually happen? This actuary is going to give us a fair value of the obligation that is your liability and also the fair value of your assets that is your investment portfolio. Or if I talk about the language of India S19, he will give you an assessment of a fair value of your present value obligation uh, deriving from defined benefit plan. That is nothing but your defined benefit obligation. And also it'll give you a fair assessment of your investment portfolio called as your plan assets. So plan obligation and plan assets are valued by the Indian actually based on certain parameters using a model called as PUCM. Based on the model, he's going to arrive at a valuation which will be observed as the appropriate value at which the ob uh, obligation or the asset should be recognized. But the management has already recognized, right? The management, whatever it has recognized, we will have to adjust it so that the value of the obligation and also the value of the asset will come down to their fair valuation as ascertained by the Indian actuary. Clear? 
Yeah. So there are things which we recognize under actuarial gain or loss. You will have to identify the actual gain or actuarial gain or loss on the obligation and also on the asset. Now the obligation and the asset both are fair valued as per your Indian actuary. This fair valuation is different from the management estimate. So the difference between the fair value and the management estimate has to be identified as actuarial gain or loss. This is the fourth uh, relative item as far as your defined benefit plan is concerned. We have seen current service cost, interest cost which are debited to PNL, expected return on plan assets which is credited to PNL. But when I come down to the fourth part that is actuarial gain or loss, I will recognize actuarial gain or loss in my statement of OCI. I will not recognize it in BNL, but I will recognize it in my statement of OCI, which is very, very much within the statement of profitability, but not in the PNL, but in the another part called a statement of OCI. What do you recognize? Actuarial gain or loss. How do I measure actuarial gain or loss? The difference between the present value of the defined benefit obligation as identified by the management estimate compared to the fair value as assessed by the actuary. The difference between both in respect of the defined benefit obligation should be recognized as actuarial gain or loss in my statement of OCI. It could be resulting in a gain if your fair value as per actuary is less than the present value or if it is if the fair value is greater than the present value then it results in a loss. But what about the plan assets? In case of the plan assets which are fair valued as per the actuary you will try to determine actuarial gain or loss by comparing two items which is your actual, uh, actual return on plan assets compared with expected return on plan assets. What is expected return? We have already seen expected return on plan assets in the earlier slide where we said expected return is nothing but the interest plus unrealized gain or loss on plan asset minus the fund administration cost which is identified as expected return as a percentage applied on plan assets. So the difference between the expected return and actual return will be considered as my actual gain or loss on plan assets. So first of all, what is this actual, sorry, actual return on plan assets? My actual return on plan assets, I think I missed the slide. So I'll tell you how to calculate actual return on plan assets guys. So if I have an actual return on plan assets, I will measure it in this manner. Guys, you remember capital definition or how do I identify capital in balance sheet? Opening capital. Plus additional capital. Minus drawings plus profit during the current period that profit of current year this should give us the closing capital Our discussion point was actual return on plan assets. No. Why did capital come into picture? I'll tell you. Similar is your cycle even for your fair value of as a plan assets as well. Go like this. Opening fair value of plan assets. Opening fair value of plan assets. Plus additional capital is nothing but contributions to the fund. Contribution in current year. Every year there is a contribution which has to be made by the enterprise towards the defined benefit obligation. Such contributions minus benefits paid during the current year any employee has retired then the benefit has to be paid 
प्लस एक्चुअल रिटर्न ऑन प्लान एसेट विच इज नथिंग बट सिमिलर टू आर करंट इयर प्रॉफिट और लॉस शुड रिजल्ट इन क्लोजिंग फेयर वैल्यू ऑफ प्लान एसेट्स should result in closing fair value of plan sx very similar to our capital very similar to how we calculate capital same way i am calculating even for plan sx but the entire point is to calculate what is actual return so how do i get actual return use the same formula and calculate actual return actual return on plan assets is equal to now use the same formula and tell me how do i calculate closing fair value of plan assets closing fair value of plan assets who will do the fair valuation the actuary does the fair valuation minus opening fair value of plan sx minus contributions to the plan in the current year each year the enterprise has to contribute to the plan defined benefit plan plus drawings are nothing but benefits paid during the current year benefits paid to employee in the current year this will give us what is actual return on plan sx so therefore actual return on plan sx is equal to closing fair value minus opening fair value fair value being determined by the actuary minus contributions to the plan in the current year plus benefits paid to the employee in the current year will give us what is actual return this actual return on plan sx when compared with the expected return which was already credited to pnl the difference between these two returns shall be considered as actuarial gain or loss this actuarial gain or loss has to be recognized in the statement of oci clear on plan assets the actual return compared by expected return should be transferred to actuarial gain or loss to the oci of your statement of profitability clear so your actuarial gain or loss is identified by pucm model by valuing at fair value both your present value of obligation which is your plan obligation and also your plan assets and both these fair values when compared with the carrying value results in actuarial gain or loss guys then what is this pucm model and what assumptions do they make is it important for us to know because if you look at the standard it describes the entire pucm model assumptions that the actuary take the valuation technique that he applies so many things are there in the standard but i am not going to talk about those things why is it so because even if i know the pucm model even if i can apply the pucm model remember my valuation will not be considered as a technical expert valuation my valuation cannot be considered as actuarial valuation unless and until the actuary has signed on it therefore me knowing how the pattern of calculation is there or what are the assumptions being made is not going to change the fact that i need an actuary to do the valuation clear that is the reason why i am ignoring those steps of how to calculate your act fair value of defined benefit obligation and the fair value of plan assets by applying your pucm model under indias 19 clear but in general sense what are the assumptions that he makes he will make an assumption as to what is the expected life of my employee because immediately if there is a demise of the employee or deceased of the employee then automatically the employee benefits get payable number 2 what is the employee turnover 
how quickly is the employee expected to change the organization because if the comp if the ent uh, enterprise has a high employee turnover that means the employer is leaving the organization then the obligation will not be discounted for so long because i am expecting that the employee will leave in near future itself so that will also determine what is the expected growth rate of the salary each year what is the discount factor to be applied all these are assumptions made by the actuary in determining what is the fair value of the defined benefit obligation and also the fair value of your plan assets. Clear? Finally, once we are done with this, we go into the next step. The three things which we have to discuss after this, we have already discussed four parts. Current service cost, interest cost, return on plan assets, and actual gain or loss. These four have to be considered in PNL every year. While the first three items, current service cost, interest cost, and expected return on plan assets, should be debited or credited in the PNL, your actual gain or loss will be debited or credited in the OCI. These four items should happen every year. But there are three things which can emerge sub subsequently on a particular event. Past service cost, curtailments, settlements. Past service cost and curtailments are exact opposite to each other. I'll tell you what is past service cost, then I'll explain you what is curtailment. A past service cost is an increase in the present value of defined benefit obligation. It is an increase in the present value of defined benefit obligation. Why did your obligation increase? It can increase due to two reasons. One, the benefits payable to the employee under the plan have increased or the number of employees eligible to receive the benefits under the plan have increased. I'll tell you. Let's say I've announced a defined benefit plan and I said the benefits under this plan are only eligible to be received by managers or above hierarchy if they finish at least five years of service in the organization. And I'm saying the benefits will accrue to them and they will be paid only if they complete the next five years in the organization. And the benefits under the plan are only available to manager and above category. That's it. Two years have passed by. I observed that all the people below the manager cadre started leaving the organization. When I identified the reason, they said, sir, the plan benefits are only applicable to manager and above. Therefore, those people who are managers and above, they are continuing to the to, in the service of the company. But all those people be below the hierarchy are more inclined towards leaving the organization. So management said, okay, fine. Two years are over. I'll make an announcement saying that this plan benefits are today from now onwards applicable to even the people of assistant manager or deputy manager level as well. So what happened? Earlier, manager and above category, the number of people in the organization were 70. Now, after I included assistant managers and deputy managers, now the total number of employees who are eligible to receive benefit under the plan has shot up to 150. First to two years, when the number of employees eligible to receive the benefits under the plan are 70, you might have estimated the provision based on a particular value. But today, when the number of employees have increased to 50, automatically there is an increase in the present value of obligation. Such increase in the present value of obligation arising due to the increase in number of employees who are entitled to receive the benefits under the plan is called as past service cost. One more thing, one more example. Let's say the benefits under the plan are payable at as 20 days of salary for every completed year of service. Two years are over. I find that the managers are not happy. When I ask them, sir, what happened? That's a 20 days. We find it too less, sir. 20 days is too less. I said, fine. Two years later, the management came up with a rectification and they said, yes, 20 days looks less to us. So we are increasing the benefits under the plan to instead of 20 days per completed year of service to 30 days for every completed year of service. So what happened? The benefit is still available to those 70 employees itself. But the benefits payable under the plan 
instead of 20 days for every completed year of service became 30 days. Automatically the obligation increased. So such increase in the present value of defined benefit obligation arising due to the increase in benefits eligible to the employees under the plan is also called as past service cost. So it could arise due to increase in number of employees entitled to the plan or number of benefits which are available to each employee under the plan. Clear? This is called as past service cost. What happened in the case of past service cost? Your obligation has increased. If your obligation increases, then automatically it is a it is an expense to us. It is increasing my cost. It is increasing my obligation. Therefore, it has to be debited to PNL. Now the question comes up: Should I debit the PNL immediately when the modification is done, or can I spread it over the period? In the example which I gave you, I said the benefits of the plan will be paid after five years. When did I make a modification to the plan? After two years. Are the benefits payable under the plan already due? No, no. They will fall due after another three years. Therefore, such items or such plans are called as unvested plans. If the benefits under the plan are unvested, then the increase in the present value should be charged to PNL or should be debited to PNL over the remaining vesting period in the example three more years. Let's say the modification was done in year five itself. Year five, the benefits under the plan are due. On that day, I did a modification and there is an increase in the obligation value. Then what you do? Then these benefits payable under the plan are already vested. They are already due. In such case, whatever is the increase in the past service cost or whatever is the increase in the present value of obligation should be directly charged to PNL. It cannot be allocated over a period of time. Only if the benefits are not due, then the benefits are unvested. In such case, the increase in the present value of defined benefit obligation or the past service cost should be spread over the remaining vesting period. If the benefits payable under the plan are already vested, that means they are already due, then the increase in the present value of defined benefit obligation, that is the past service cost, should be charged to PNL immediately. Clear? What is curtailment? Exact reverse is curtailment. Because in curtailment, he says, it is a decrease in the present value of defined benefit obligation arising due to decrease in number of employees eligible to the plan or in decrease in the benefits eligible to each employee under the plan. Exact ulta of what we have dealt under past service cost. So here we are talking about increase in present value due to increase in benefits or increase in employees. Here I am talking about decrease. I am talking about decrease in present value of obligation due to decrease in benefits or decrease in number of employees. Whenever it's a curtailment, it's a reduction in the obligation. Whenever it is a reduction in the obligation, it is a gain. So therefore, such gain should be recognized in the credit of the PNL immediately when such curtailment occurs. When the curtailment occurred itself, I will start recognizing the amount of gain that is a decrease in the present value of obligation into the credit of PNL. So guys, remember past service cost or curtailment, both these situations occur only if the management or the enterprise has done some modifications to the plan. If there is no modification to the plan, there is no past service cost, no curtailment. That's why I said these are items which will appear only if a particular event occurs. Here, what is the event? Amendment or modification to the plan occurred, which has resulted either in a past service cost or could result in curtailment. Clear? Last concept under this is called a settlement. What is settlement? I call up the employee and I tell the employee, boss, you are entitled to receive so many benefits, right, from the employer. Today, I will give you one amount. You tell me how much amount you want. Tomorrow, don't claim any benefit under the post-employment benefit plan. No post-employment post health care, no pensions, nothing. Today, you tell me how much you want. That today's value is called as settlement. Settlement is a lump sum payment made to the, made to the employee in consideration to waiving off the future benefits payable to employee. So, 
employee is eligible to receive some benefits from the employer in future, he is waiving off all those benefits. But for waiving off those benefits, today he is accepting one single payment. Guys, let's say an employee is at the age of 35 or 40, right? His retirement benefits will accrue to him at the age of 60. You don't know, first of all, whether I will be alive or not, whether I will be able to enjoy those benefits or not. Today, I need those money. I want to buy a house. I want to buy a lavish car. I want to go on a foreign trip. So all these expenses cannot be met out of my salary. So if the employer comes out with a proposal saying that today you take 10 lakhs, forget about every other benefit that you will receive after your employment. I said, fine, today's 10 lakhs is more important to me. So he has taken the today's value and this is called a settlement. Whenever a settlement occurs, I will have to compare the amount paid under settlement with the current carrying value of the present benefit obligation. I will compare the settlement value or the settlement amount paid with the carrying value of the defined benefit obligation. The difference between the settlement amount and the Carrying value of the defined benefit obligation should be recognized in the PN. If your benefit paid is more than the carrying value, then it is a loss debited to PN. If your settlement value is much less than the present value of obligation, then in such case it is again credit to PN. These are the three things which we have to discuss apart from the four items which occur every year. But the last three items, past service cost, curtailment, settlement, these three emerge only when a particular situation appears, only when there is an event which occurs, an event of increase in the benefits of the plan have arised, an event of decrease in the number of employees eligible to the plan have arised, an event of settlement has occurred, only in such cases these three items will appear and will be given effect to in the PNL. Clear? Concept clear so far?
the last concept under your uh, employee benefits is a small concept regarding termination benefit. What is the termination benefit and when does it arise? These termination benefits arise when the employer employee or uh, you know relationship is terminated. That means you basically end the employer employee relationship which results in certain benefits being paid by the employer to the employee. Pink slip, three months salary in advance, termination benefit. Golden handshake offered to bankers. In your banking profession, when golden handshake was offered, let's say an employee has another 10 years of service. He is coming up to you and saying that, sir, I leave. I can't do this computer work. You know, today, the banking has become more a computer duty. I don't know how many of you have been to bank audits. You find the core banking softwares. So whenever you look at those core banking softwares, you need to understand that India earlier in our banking system, we never had this core banking software. There's no centralized banking. So we had particular home branches in which we bank. So from there, when it transformed, so these employees who could not transfer or who could not learn the computer core banking software, they left the organization. To leave the organization, they were incentivized. 10 years of salary, if you would have served, I would have paid you so much. But today, since you're leaving, I'll pay you a fraction of that. You get out of the organization. Don't come from tomorrow. Whatever money you got, you can do some business or you can do any other activity. This is a general thing which has applied to everyone. So that is called as golden hatchet. So either a VRS scheme which was given to government employees. All these are concepts which are emerging out of termination benefit. So what is a termination benefit? How do I account for it? A termination benefit, an entity is required to recognize a liability and an expense for termination benefit at the earlier of the date on which the entity has no longer an option to withdraw from the benefits of the plan. I have announced a plan and the entity does not have an option to withdraw from the plan. I have already told the employees at the age of 45 or above are eligible to apply for the plan before 31st March and I have no option to withdraw. If the employee comes up, I will have to pay him that benefit. It is called as a termination benefit to be recognized as a liability and an expense. And the entity recognizes cost for restructuring within the scope of India's 37 and involves a payment of termination benefit. Guys, let's say for example, now you see bank mergers which are happening, right? You find that basically Andhra bank got merged with some other bank. You find that some other bank got merged with another bank. When these mergers happen, then the banking has got restricted because you find two banks having branches right beside each other. Now, once the bank merger happened, then some branches will be eliminated. When the elimination of branches happened, then certain number of employees also have to be removed from service because two branches will have two branch managers. Now, if one of the branches eliminated, I need only one branch manager. So in that case, those are called as restructuring costs. Whenever you recognize a restructuring which is occurring, then it involves termination benefits. In such cases, I'll have to recognize a liability and an expense for termination benefit. Now, I'll have to make sure that the entire termination benefit is recognized in the statement of PNL when either of these two events occur. When I have already announced a plan, I have no, no option to withdraw from the plan. And I've already identified recognition of restructuring cost and this involves the payment of termination benefit. In such cases, the termination benefits payable to an employee should be recognized in the, on the date on which the termination benefits are payable. When they become due, that is sufficient for you to recognize these termination benefits as expense in the statement of your PNL. Clear? And that will bring us to the end of discussion on this concepts of India's 19 that is accounting for employee benefits. Yeah.